Brought to you by Chemistry. Hello and welcome back to Brought to You by Chemistry with me, Dr. Alex Lathbridge. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the links between air quality and government policies. Basically, how can scientific evidence help shape the government policies that affect us all? And how can local and national policies help our environment and our health? To find out, let's bring in some guests. All right, so my name is Audrey de Nazel, uh, Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College. I'm a senior lecturer there. And, uh, and so, yes, introducing myself is, is, is rather complex. I never know what to say exactly about uh, uh, who I am, what I do. My work is very multidisciplinary, so I work on lots of different uh, angles of uh, different issues. But the, 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 the theme that brings it all together is uh, cities and health. So how to make cities healthier, how to make healthier built environments and more sustainable built environments. I mean, your indecisiveness about choosing what to focus on sort of smacks of someone that just really wants as much funding as possible. Is that what this is? I feel <laughs> as though that's what this is. <laughs> that's funny. I never thought of it that way. No, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, no, I. So I recently discovered I, I was dyslexic, and that might have something to do with it. So my brain goes all over the place. Uh, so I see very much the big picture. Um, which is apparently a characteristic of, a characteristic of dyslexic people, which uh, I didn't realize until recently. That's my new excuse before I just, then, you know, I was just feeling uncomfortable about it. Now I feel a bit better about it. Um, so so I, I can't help but see all the, the how different uh, dots connect. And I uh, so I go deep into one area of research and realize that actually this is meaningless if you don't look at this as well and that as well. And so that's why it's very hard for me to to uh, one hone in on something, uh, because I, for me, the important thing is how everything is inter interconnected and making that case for thinking in, in systems. When it comes to air quality in major cities, you know, cities all around the world, what what is it like, and is London uh, particularly different? No, uh, London is not necessarily different. I mean, each each city has its own pe uh, peculiarities for sure. And uh, but in terms of how we address air pollution, it's different locations will have different main sources. Um, but in cities, transportation tends to be the major source of, of air pollution. Of course, some places will have a lot of industry or agriculture or uh, you know burning uh, agricultural products, for example. But uh, but most cities have a, a one one big issue with air pollution, and that's air, uh, transport. And pretty much every city in the world has air pollution problems. So that's one thing that brings every city together. There's there's it's very hard to find a city that is not going to have uh, some level of air pollution that's detrimental to people's health. Uh, so where how you go about uh, uh, addressing these air pollution problems will vary a bit. But one common issue again in cities is. One thing that needs to be tackled is uh, air pollution from traffic, from transport. I suppose I'm a little bit sport here because I've been in London all of my life. It's all I know. Cities are all I know. But when it comes to looking at you know places that people congregate, you know, taking it from small to big, you know, you've got villages, towns, and then the little thing, and then cities. You know, are there differences at each level is it a matter of scale like once you get to a city level it's just like yep yeah, there are lots of people there's lots of transport therefore there's going to be a lot of pollution uh so that it's not as simple as that because there are lots of other aspects of uh air, contributions to air pollution so there are different sources from outside so uh, if you live in an area where there's a lot of shipping and the uh, and the wind that comes from shipping, then that's going to be another contribution. If there's a lot of agriculture, there's going to be a lot of uh, contribution from that. Uh, so, uh, and the scale of the city it doesn't matter as much as uh, as what the other contributions are going to be. But of course, uh, so so the scale of the city is not going to matter uh, as much as uh, the different contributions from the different sources, which going to ma matter in terms of what kind of other sources are there, uh, whether it's industry or shipping uh, or agriculture, or whether um, uh, the, the, the meteorological patterns also have a huge impact on, on air pollution. So the size of the city doesn't necessarily matter as much, but of course, the bigger this, the city, the more uh, people there are in there, so the more uh, reason for sources of air pollution in there. 
in particular from transport, but not only from transport, just from regular activities in people's lives. So yes, having more people tends to have an impact on higher levels of air pollution, but doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be the case, right? It, the density matters, uh, and uh, as I said, all the other sources matter. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now. I'm going to assume that what you're saying is backed up by actual science. Uh, but just for me and the listeners, right, but mostly for me, like how do you actually go about assessing how how well air air quality policies actually work? You know, in London, we, we're bringing in the ULES, the ultra low emission zone. But how do you actually go about uh, sort of assessing how well they're working short term and I guess in the long term? Yeah, so that's actually a really complex problem. It sounds like it would probably be simple, right? You put in a policy, uh, you uh, you could tweak some the numbers in a model, or you can just take some measurements. But actually, the problem about air pollution is that there are lots of different things that lead to air pollution levels. So if you put in a policy, it will change one small bit of the system usually. Um, so what policies tend to be targeted on one specific item, uh, and you have to account for the fact that there are trends in terms of meteorology, there are trends in terms of other things happening in the world or locally that will also have an impact on, on air pollution. So ideally to be able to uh, assess the impacts of a policy, you would do uh, some measurements before and after the policy, but not only in the area where you have a policy, but also in a control area so that you can compare the changes in air pollution over time uh, to a change in air pollution over time in a similar area, but without that policy, right? That's the ideal way of doing it. So what's called a natural experiment. But of course, these are very difficult to put in place because finding the control area that <laughs> has similar characteristics, especially for something that you implement uh, an entire city is gonna be complex. Plus most, uh, so, so that, that complexity of, of before, after, uh, in a similar area but that doesn't have the policy compared to this, the, your own area, that, that's always called, uh, a complex issue. But in addition to that, most policies only tackle one source of, uh, of air pollution. I mean, we're talking about air pollution. And uh, there are multiple sources of air pollution. So, for example, if you take the, the case of transport in, in London, uh, we, you have maybe about 50% uh, of emissions uh, from, um, come from transport, uh, of air pollution emissions, uh, a particular matter in nitrogen dioxide. So about half of the emissions will come from London. But because there are lots of sources that come from outside London, London when you look at the concentration, so what's in your air, in the air, it's only between uh, uh, 15 and 25 percent that will come from from that sort from transportation sources. So you're really tackling only a small bit of the overall concentration. So detecting some changes is always going to be complex. So it's it's uh, so that kind of natural experiment. And ideally, you would have to be able to look at uh, uh, to see how if policies work. You have a very clear cut like a uh, a coal mine or a uh, some industry in a city that that shuts down and look at before and after and that's that's relatively simple but um for more diffuse type of policies that are that take time to implement uh and have impacts elsewhere it's complex okay okay so the answer is it's complex you could have yeah. started with that no no i'm kidding that was actually a very very solid answer i really like that so when we're looking at cities, right, no two cities are the same. You know, there we were talking about London. But if we say, take it to, you know, like you say, a sort of a natural experiment, let's say we were comparing somewhere like London and Manchester. Yeah, those are the two cities that popped into my head. London's like 9 million in population, multiple millions in population. Manchester, I'm going to say like half a million to a million with differences in populations do air quality policies like take that into account do they have bigger impacts in cities with bigger populations so that makes sense like if your policy is doing a good thing and it's affecting more people because you're in a larger city versus doing the same thing in a smaller city would you then say this uh, this policy is better in one city than the other does that make sense do you know what i mean well it doesn't really make sense because uh <laughs> You, Solid. So, <laughs> no, in the sense that 
Air, so air pollution issues are so large. The impacts of air pollution on health are so significant, not only in terms of the number of people who die from it or premature deaths, but also how it affects our children's brain development, our children's lung development, our uh, 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 development of diabetes, of asthma, respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, dementia, all these different uh, aspects of air pollution we know are so tremendous that no matter where you live, you need to reduce air pollution. And no matter where you live, you need to reduce air pollution from multiple ways, not multiple sources. You need to put all the policies on the table and not just focus on one. So yes, of course, some policies will maybe have a bit better effect in one location than the other, but it, no matter what, you have to put it all you can to reduce uh, le levels of air pollution so we can, so we don't have to live with our children having their, their brains not developed to their full potential, right? We, we all agree on that. So it's, it's everything needs to be put in place. Will what, some locations be better at it? Ah, yes, uh, it might be that uh, some locations will have be more readily available, uh, have, have better public transportation. So you can implement it immediately, some car reduction policies, people will have an al alternative. Other places are more sprawled, have, are less compact. Uh, so it will be, it'll take longer time to to uh, to implement the the policy in such a way that it will have uh, an effect and what people will accept it. So of course the way you implement policies are going to be different. But but your question about <laughs> you know does the scale matter? Does the location specifically matter? And how effective a policy is? It might matter a bit, but uh, in uh, the reality is in the end you, you just need to put it all we can uh, to address this this major problem. Which uh, well. I mean, it's not, of course, it's not only an air pollution problem, it's also a climate change problem, and it's also a benefit in multiple other ways to our, our health and quality of lives to, lives to put in some, some, some very transformative policies. So the bottom line is, wherever you are, you need to put a, a, a very ambitious, transformative policies uh, in place to reduce our air pollution and have multiple other benefits. So I guess the idea that it's sort of a, a zero-sum, like utilitarian type thing, saying that you've got to put in a policy in bigger cities versus smaller cities, that, that doesn't really work out because it's about having any positive, no matter the scale and the, the size of the place, because it's about making human health and to some extent climate change better. Exactly. No matter where you are, we need to put uh, uh, air pollution policies in place. Whether you live in a smaller city or a bigger city, we need to address air pollution to, to promote people's health. Absolutely. OK, so um, you, you're saying all that good stuff, but how do you actually make it happen? All right. Tell me the secret. What's the secret <laughs> source to this? All right. How, how what actually motivates people to change their behavior when it comes to you know, improving air quality. I mean, this this seems like something right up your research alley. So what what motivates people? So it's not just about motivating people with, uh, uh, oh, please do the right thing, you know, be altruistic, think about others. It's more about making the, the right choice the easy one so that uh, whatever uh, behavior you have, and of course it's not only about behavior, uh, but behaviors, it has to be a component. Of any kind of policy, right? I mean, we can, we we have to have technological solutions. We need to have uh, the, uh, electric vehicles for ambulances, etc. But we also need to have people to engage into actually uh, changing their their behaviors for better air quality and better climate change, etc. So, in terms of behavior change specifically, um, the the number one thing is creating the infrastructure, the environment that enables the behavior change. So you can't bang on to people about uh, get out of their cars, get on a bike, if there's traffic all over them and they're too scared to, to bike. You can't say, well, just don't be scared. <laughs> you need to create that infrastructure so that people feel comfortable and so that it's not only the possible to do, but it's also the most appealing choice. So if you create um, uh, cities, compact cities where destinations are close to each other. So what we've uh, more and more talked about 15 minute cities. So creating uh, neighborhoods where uh, all the essential locations that people have to uh, uh, go to in, in their everyday lives is within a, a, a 10, 15 minute walking distance. So even better for cycling distance. So first you create that compactness, that 15 minute city uh, type of area. Then you have, you have to create the, the infrastructure 
the the bicycle lanes, uh, the the sidewalks, obviously uh, trees to provide shade, the the um, safe intersections, uh, cycle parking places. So you create the infrastructure so that the easy solution is to walk, to bike, take public transportation, rather than the default easy thing, get, get in your car that's uh, sitting right in front of your house and get to the parking lot in front of the school, right? So uh, so making that infrastructure the, is the to enable the right type of behavior, or the, the healthier type of behavior, the more sustainable type of behavior is the number one thing to do. Once uh, in accompanying that, of course, you also need to engage people uh, through more motivational campaigns, for example. And to do that, uh, because, and you do the, you need to do that for two reasons. One, to motivate people to change their behaviors, but also because you need to have citizens behind uh, the, the, the push for those uh, transformative policies. It's very difficult for policymakers to make that change without feeling that the citizens, uh, or the, without the indication that citizens are behind them and pushing for those transformative changes. So to do that, uh, you need to explain simply uh, what are the, the, the benefits of uh, strategies, transformations that uh, address air pollution. And to motivate people in a way that's, that's most convincing, one is you need to have a positive message. So of course, air pollution is scary. Of course, we're, uh, and of course, climate change is, is scary. And it's important for people to realize the urgency but it's also important for people to realize that actually it's a benefit to, to their health, right? It's a benefit to their quality of life to put those, those, uh, those policies in place. So, so, so bringing out a lot more the positive aspects. So we're, we've got something to look forward to. It's not that we're having to sacrifice ourselves and not be able to drive everywhere uh, just for the benefit of others. It's actually something that can benefit our own health. We can have better quality of life, protect our, ourselves, from uh, even from from uh, infectious disease like uh, COVID nineteen, right? Uh, having a better immune system, um, uh, having a better cardiovascular health, uh, having our children uh, develop themselves to their full potential, brain wise and lung wise. All these things are are something things that we can we can look forward to. But not only that, when we put very transformative solutions in, in place, such as getting people. Uh, um, to walk, bike, take public transportation rather than drive, you're not only benefiting air pollution and climate change, but you're creating an environment that's much more uh, healthy, welcoming, uh, places that people want to live in, places that people want to cherish, places that people want to spend time in. When it comes to like air quality policies, you know, these aren't things that you turn on and then magically everything gets better. Like, you know, your work, you know, People know that, you know that from research. So how do you get people to think about and to remain motivated about policies that work in the long term when, you know, they might be dead by then? You know? Yeah, absolutely essential. That's, that, and that's why you have to really not just talk to people, but engage <laughs> uh, and, and, and co-create. So bring everybody to the table to, to help everybody give their their... Uh, ideas, their opinions, their uh, their needs for their what they want uh, for their long that long term vision, that short term vision. So that that engagement is 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 essential from that perspective. But also in terms of researchers, what we can bring to the table is demonstrating the impacts for themselves and for others today and in the future, so that we can understand that clear vision of what what might happen and understand the impacts of various alternatives. So, for example, um, uh, if you uh, are able to, if you engage people um, to change their travel uh, modes, so that so that they, as in their daily lives, uh, they walk or bike instead of driving, that uh, means that there's they get physical activity as part of their daily lives. And I don't know how you are, but I certainly, uh, with two children, full time job, I have zero time to go to the gym but I get to cycle to my office. I'm very lucky. And that gives me all the physical activity I need, which I would never get otherwise, right? So it's, it's an easy way to get your physical activity as part of your daily lives. That makes me fit. <laughs> that makes me a happier person, uh, a, a better mental health, better uh, physical health, a, 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 better, a better mother to my children because I'm more relaxed, et cetera, et cetera. 
So if you can make that clear to people that it's uh, not just about air pollution, but there are other benefits. So physical activity is one of them, but also think about how our cities could look like if you were to reduce the number of cars. You could replace that with, um, with trees, parklets, green space, which we know has all those benefits, not only for exposure to green space, but also for play area for kids, but also drainage for stormwater management, for cooling the cities. There's all those other multiple benefits. And so I think that vision, if we think of, of cities, not just as one thing at a time, like air pollution and climate change, but actually it's a system with multiple things that are connected. And you're able to, to show that vision of what our cities could look like, happier, healthier places for all. I think that's the way to uh, to bring people on board and, and engage them towards that positive vision. So we need to create that vision together with people. Ask ask people what is it that you want in your cities. Okay, so I think um, that I always like to save my most difficult question for last. Um, I told you that it was going to be introducing yourself, but no, the most difficult question is we always like to have our listeners go away with you know something one one thing that sums up the episode something that they can go away and tell people about so if you could say one thing for our listeners to take away what would it be so i think it would be about um thinking ahead of what it is uh, what the kind of places we really want to live in and 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 thinking about the multiple types of of benefits that can emerge from cities that are transformed so a much better quality of life for all of us uh, living in cities where we don't have to fear for our lives when we walk in the streets, when we let our kids run out in the streets, uh, where we can interact more easily with our neighbors, which um, people who walk and bike tend to interact more with their neighbors, where we can uh, have uh, friendly environments that are human scale, um, when we can have um, uh, uh, green space, play areas. So it's that vision, that uh, uh, looking ahead of, of where where we want to live in the future. And just to, one image I all often think about. Uh, I think we, we look at pictures today of uh, of, of people back then and uh, smoking and movies, etc. And we think, what were they thinking? Now we look at uh, the cities we live in and cars everywhere. I'm convinced that when we see pictures and videos and films of, of, of today, the street, cities today, and we see cars everywhere, people will be thinking, what were they thinking? What, I mean, why? Why do that to ourselves? So I think that, 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 that future city is going to be one where we're actually you know, in an environment that we want to live in, not just surrounded by, by traffic cars and uh, the, that, that all the aggressivity and the, and, the, and, and the harm that comes with it. I love it. 